so you can interrupt me. That's okay, actually. And we can proceed with go for uh, like actually for Docker for GoDevs. And this will be kind of talk about like how to get started with Docker, how to actually uh, make your Docker files, how uh, to structure your Go apps, some tips. Uh, and it's basically like this presentation will be, I guess, more about Docker than uh, Go actually, but it will be like kind of a uh, place where you can find how to use uh, Go with Docker and not be scared of that. So on our agenda is uh, first we'll look how to design apps with, Go, with Docker in mind. Uh, we will look at some Docker files, some suggestions for CI/CD, and actual the workflow, and we will have a demo uh, of this actually too. So let's start with small disclaimer actually. So uh, Docker on itself is like really complex topic and like uh, I want to notify that uh, I'm not total Docker expert and I may not know some things. And this presentation is based on my findings and some best practices that I saw. So it actually may not use uh, some other best practices or not follow them. And generally, it's like it depends on what you're wanting to achieve. And uh, some things that I will talk about might not apply to you. So be aware of that, actually. And first, like let's design Go applications with Docker in mind. And there's a few steps. And actually, it's just use Go. That's it. Uh, and the reason for that is because actually for running uh, applications in Docker using Go, you actually don't need to do anything special as actually in any other language, basically. But uh, in Go, we get some few benefits actually uh, that can help us running our apps in Docker. So uh, some of them there are, uh, we have a single binary executable. So uh, we don't need to have like full our source code to run our application. Uh, as for example, in any scripting language, we don't need to have a ton of dependencies from third parties, uh, especially uh, if you are not using CGO, uh, our single uh, binary is actually statically linked, so it doesn't have any dependencies at all. So you can run it uh, on any distro actually, and like it will not require you anything. Uh, also, quite good thing actually is uh, that our code is generally cross-platform. So um, in most cases, you can uh, test your code locally. For example, if you are using a Windows machine or Mac OS machine, uh, you can test your code locally, uh, even though like uh, Docker runs uh, only on Linux. There are cases running it on Windows, but uh, like actual Windows containers, but generally we are running them on Linux. So it's quite good to have that. Uh, another thing is that we have our Go modules and it's actually really powerful thing for us because it uh, will, uh, allows us to uh, describe our dependencies explicitly. So uh, there will be no such thing that like we uh, wouldn't able to run something because of some meeting dependencies. So if it runs locally, it will run uh, in Docker. And also one uh, good thing that sometimes people don't uh, know uh, is actually like when we have our Go uh, one promise of compatibility, it actually states that uh, even though we are uh, updating the language, so Go compiler updates like every year twice, uh, but actually uh, you can run uh, on your version of compiler, you can run code that was written for any of the versions. So, uh, actually, uh, we can use, for example, even latest compiler to compile our code and uh, uh, not be worried about changing our code because we uh, updated the compiler. So it should work as expected previously. Also, one really good thing uh, is uh, fast compilation time. So we actually can use something like hot reloading uh, for our uh, applications, even in Docker. So. Uh, this is quite good benefit because it allows for uh, really fast development. You're not really needing that uh, uh, like every time and for every application. 
and even for sometimes uh, you have applications that like can't run with helter loading because it will be like really hard to do them because they have like some for example uh, pre-configurations that needs to be done to test your thing but uh, uh, generally speaking you can use that uh, also one thing that uh, go actually has great tool ecosystem and uh, if you're uh, using some dependencies uh, it's like uh, good to use them if they are built in go because you can just install them using go install and you don't even need to care about what this you're running on uh, like uh, will it compile on my machine or something like that so uh, you're using go you can install your dependencies also like that and like it will not matter like are you running that in uh, debian or alpine or even scratch image so uh, you just need to uh, know what is the dependency uh, and also one cool thing is that go has uh, relatively low cpu and ram usage so it's relatively low compared like for example to java and uh, something like Zelt. Uh, it's with asterisks because uh, uh, it depends on what you're doing. And yep, you can definitely get like really high CPU and RAM usage, but uh, generally speaking, you don't need to have uh, some large uh, environment to run your uh, Docker for testing. And like you can easily run that on your local machine. So it will not uh, like uh, stress your machine. So it should be good. And there are actually a lot of more, but we'll not talk about that another thing is uh, when you're designing uh, go applications and actually any app uh, it's good to follow uh, 12 factor uh, app practices so they're opinionated i mean opinionated but uh, actually some of them like are i guess really basic but you should not forget about that uh, and actually like some uh, of the most important for us is uh, dependencies so you should always uh, declare your dependencies explicitly so it doesn't matter what you're doing it's always better to, to do that explicitly um, especially for docker you should store your configuration in environment uh, so uh, you can store your configs in files or some other places but uh, it's the easiest way to do that is using environment variables. So you can change them on the fly. Uh, you can uh, use that uh, even without Docker because you can start your application uh, without Docker if you're using environment variables. Uh, if you're not using files as here, uh, you should not worry about how to mount them into volumes and how to pass them into the containers. So it, it's, uh, really allows you to make quick changes and uh, be good with that. Uh, some also obvious thing is that you should uh, expose your service as port, uh, so actually uh, use a network, uh, because generally speaking, uh, moving files uh, between file system and Docker uh, is not something that you would generally do in production, so uh, it's uh, not good to expose your service uh, in some other different ways because generally like you're writing uh, web servers or some TCP server, UDP server, it doesn't matter, but you should expose it like with networking. Uh, another thing is scalability. Uh, and actually in 12 fact for app, it mentions as concurrency, but for us, it actually means that uh, we should design our app in such a way that uh, we should expect that like more than one instance of our application can run at the same time using the same resources. So, for example, if you are storing some uh, data about requests that are uh, coming from users, uh, you should definitely uh, do something to uh, uh, keep track of the data outside of your applications or if you are choosing to, to store it uh, uh, in like memory, you should, for example, configure your load balancer to uh, be sticky to always point to uh, correct instance of the application, but it's generally like not advised because uh, it's not stable, actually. 
always. Uh, so uh, you should keep in mind that uh, it's good to have your applications uh, running in such a way that you can uh, easily uh, add new instances. And the last one for us is actually disposability. Uh, and uh, returning to previous, you should know that your service can easily die at any time or not because of some error, just because, for example, you changed uh, your auto scaling, for example, and you scaled, for example, from two running containers to, for example, 10, or you scaled down from 10 to five. And that means that uh, uh, your app should not store some data uh, that is required to run uh, in memory because it should be easily disposable. So you should have uh, a fast startup. That is generally what we have in Go because we even if you're compiling uh, and uh, running your application in each container, that, that's actually okay, but not in the, recommended even though you still will get like good performance because go has really fast compile time and you should not you should remember to add graceful down for your apps to, for closing any uh, connection not to lose uh, some requests uh, and yep so the next thing we will talk about docker files and for those who are not really familiar very well with docker so uh, Docker file is basically a place where you explicitly define what is your Docker image, like what should run there. But what is Docker image? Docker image is actually uh, under the hood, just a read-only file system. Uh, when and when you are doing some changes, for example, adding some files, running some commands, it just creates new layer on top of previous one. So for example, you have on like lowest layer, you have your uh, operating system files, then you added some applications. So it created new layer, then you added your source code, it, it added new layer. And after that, you like executed your application. So it adds new layer. And this concept of layers is uh, like really important for us because uh, we should know that uh, each layer in our Docker image, it adds, uh, uh, complexity in terms of uh, build speed and also uh, size of the image, which actually like uh, represents our actual deploy speed because every time you need to run your application, if you don't have your Docker image uh, handy, you should re-download it. So uh, the smaller the image is, the faster it will be. Uh, and lastly, when we have our Docker image, uh, we can actually create one or like actually any number of containers from it. So uh, Docker gets like all the data that was in image and uh, it creates a new container that is actually really small uh, virtual machine uh, under the hood that will run like really small operating system and it will execute whatever you decided to put there. So basically you're having your Docker files, uh, it builds to Docker images that are static and you cannot change them because they are read-only. So if you want to change it, you need to create new image. And after that, you're running uh, exact images. So for that, uh, what are the, like the most basic Docker file for Go? It's actually pretty simple. So uh, we are running from uh, base image that is Go. And like, for example, here I specified version 1.20. And by default, uh, uh, Go images are based on Debian. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind. Uh, after that, we specified that we should use some directory. Uh, we copied from our source code, our Go mode and Go sum. Uh, and we actually downloaded dependencies. And see, we are using right now uh, Go command. That's because we already have that in our image. So that's good. Uh, we are downloading our dependencies and only after that we are copying uh, our source code and uh, running build command to, to build our application and run that with CMD. So why should we uh, separate those things actually? Because as I said, uh, our Docker images are basically read-only file system with layers. 
So each comment in Docker file actually creates new layer. And for example, when we are copying files, it creates new layer. When you are running some comments, it, it creates new layer. And uh, for things like dependencies, uh, as we not so often changing dependencies and uh, like more oftenly we change only our source code, we can first uh, get our uh, game mode and go some after the download dependencies. And each time Docker will know that if those files weren't changed, we can uh, cache that and uh, not run uh, those commands again. So our build will be much faster in that case. Uh, and after that, we are just running them. So uh, better way to uh, run Docker is actually creating multi-stage build. And uh, in Docker files, multi-stage is basically a way to create multiple images from one Docker file. Uh, it's kind of strange. Uh, but uh, in general, like for example, we can have an image to build our app and then separate image to only run our app. Uh, so what is the point of that? Actually, we are gaining uh, uh, speed of uh, deploy because, for example, in our Go image, uh, we have all the Go to toolchain and probably some more applications that are like required for go tool chain, for example, for Cgo or something like that, Git, curl, and whatever. So the image is actually large. Uh, and later we will see like what are the differences between images. And for example, for our running uh, application, we actually don't need Go at all. So we only need to have uh, our executable. So there's no point of uh, actually in production uh, having our uh, image based on uh, Go image, which has all the tool chain and uh, all applications. So we can save uh, even on storage and run that in the stage. So what are the common stages when uh, we are doing that? So uh, I've come up with some common things that like I think is useful, but depending on your um, environment, it can be different. So for me, it's source uh, stage, uh, which contains source code and dependencies. Dev stage is for local development, which may include hot reloading. Uh, you can also run your tests and linters inside uh, Docker. It's also an option. And uh, last two is to build an executable and to run like actual release image. So let's walk through those images. And like, for example, for source image, we can have, for example, running our Golang uh, image with Alpine, for example. So we are setting uh, CGO as zero. And uh, I'll uh, describe why this is uh, a bit later. And again, we are downloading our Go mode and GoSum and dependencies and only copying the source code. So this is our source image, which we can use later for all our stages next. So this is useful because uh, in most cases, you want uh, your source code to be uh, immutable after you want to uh, build it, release it, test it. So for example, if you are testing on one code and actually releasing another code, what is the point of that? So this gives us immutability, as I said, because our uh, images are read only image layers, actually. <clears throat> so uh, next step is to run our app locally. And here is a simple example of running it with debugger uh, DLV and uh, actually reusing uh, hot reloading uh, with uh, uh, app called Air. Both of them can be installed using Go. Uh, so as you can see, I'm using uh, Go install and, and package name. So. This is really useful for us because uh, in source, we are using Go image as a base. So we have our Go to chain here uh, and we can easily do that. And after that, we are using entry point to run that. Um, after that, we can have uh, uh, like kind of strange uh, source image because like, for example, in source, we didn't have any entry point and C or CMD because we didn't run anything. So it was like kind of preparation image. Uh, in 
there we actually have entry point to run our application but in uh, test image uh, we can actually run our tests for example run linters or like anything that need to be done uh, and basically when our image will be built uh, those commands will run uh, and it will uh, fail the build if some of them fails so this is really useful for us because uh, we are not uh, depending on the environment we are when we where we are running our tests so we already have our golden chain in our source image so we can use go test uh, and also we can for example install linters using again go install uh, and run that so it gives us predictability and uh, uh, it will work on any machine actually so this is quite good advantage for us but uh, actually we don't need to do that and running tests uh, in ci or locally is also an option here for <clears throat> uh, the next step we can use uh, build uh, and what is the advantage of having build separate from release actually because we don't need uh, our go tool chain to run our uh, application and here's an example how to run uh, go build with some uh, like pretty cool things that are uh, ld flux and uh, app called uh, upx so actually when we are building our image uh, we are trying to minimize the image size to maximize our deploy speed and also to reduce uh, uh, cost on saving all of that images in our registries so uh, here's like some examples uh, when we are just using go build uh, average executable like with hello world as i remember will be about uh, 16 megabytes and it will take around a second to build if we include ld flux uh, and dash s and this dash w will actually strip debug information so that is needed to run our debugger to provide some more detailed panic uh, exceptions and uh, things like that so generally in production we don't need that uh, so we can reduce our size uh, to 11 megabytes which is already almost five megabytes less and after that uh, we can use some tools like upx so it actually packs uh, the binary uh, and when uh, the application is running on the startup it will unpack it uh, so uh, this actually gives us a uh, really good in decreasement in size of so actually 3.5 megabytes compared to 16 uh, it's a like huge increasement yep the build process will take like uh, almost seven seconds but keep in mind that we are building only once so this is not an issue for us generally and actually in terms of performance uh, yep you will get uh, a bit slower st startup time but uh, generally it will not affect uh, like long running applications so uh, if you're building for example command line tool or something like that maybe it's not uh, a good idea if you're critical on speed to use such thing because yes it will uh, decrease startup time but for example for http servers or something like that you can easily use that uh, to decrease your image size dramatically and again here's link uh, for like the source uh, with a bit more explanation of uh, how to perform such thing and what are the better options and the final image is actually release image uh, it has a couple of things like uh, health check and copy and cover uh, binary and uh, for our release image I actually choose scratch image uh, and as you may know this image uh, doesn't have anything so it even doesn't have shell or something like that uh, so for that uh, for example if you want to run health check uh, on our application and it's for example web server uh, we don't have curl here so we can't easily ping our service to check if it's healthy or not so i actually like some time ago made a really small go app that actually has a single statically linked binary that uh, has 
uh, ability to call some service uh, on uh, slash health API. So it will uh, provide like uh, information about health. Uh, and uh, for running our apps in Scratch image, uh, we actually don't have uh, CA certificates, central authority certificates. Uh, those needed to verify HTTP requests, uh, actually, HTTPS requests, uh, because our Scratch image, as I said, doesn't have anything from start. So we need those to run. And we are copying uh, uh, our binary demo from build. So uh, in our final image, we will have only uh, two binaries, actually one for health check, which is actually optional, uh, and one for running our application. Uh, also, one thing that I wanted to discuss here is uh, a difference between entry point and CMD and why here, for example, I'm using entry point. Uh, so basically, uh, entry point is a thing that will uh, run uh, before the CMD, you may say. But actually, like, for example, if you will have entry point demo and CMD help, the result that will be run is actually will be demo help. So in entry point, you can run some uh, scripts, for example, that uh, needs to initialize something or something like that on startup. Uh, and in CMD, like you can actually run your actual command that runs your application. Or uh, you can use entry point to run your application and CMD to provide some command line arguments to your application, which is really handy if you're using, for example, Dirt Recompose. It, it will be like really easy to do that. So generally speaking, you need to remember that uh, Actually, entry point and CMD, it's just concatenated together and run as shell command. So mm, keep in mind that uh, like you should use uh, them properly and not to mess up. OK, so let's talk about base images. Uh, Actually, like default Go uh, image is uh, using Debian under the hood and also officially go support Alpine. So as you can see, uh, latest Debian image is about 300 megabytes. Uh, and keep in mind that this is only base image without any of your stuff. So uh, additionally to base image, you will download your source code, your any dependencies and something like that. So final image size will be bigger, but base image is like the size, um, and for example, if you are using multi-stage build, uh, you can use other images to uh, run uh, your application. So you don't need to have a uh, go tool chain, as I said. So we can use uh, any image. And for example, if you're using Debian, the size will be 53 megabytes. Uh, there is also a better version, I guess, of Debian Slim. So it's reduced uh, with less of tools. So it might fit your use case, but might not. Uh, also good choice is plain Ubuntu. So it's 26 megabytes. And if you're really concerned about size of your image, you can use Alpine. So generally speaking, those images are tend to be like three or four megabytes in size. So compared to 301 uh, megabyte using Debian with go tool chain. So this is like a hundred times decreasement. Uh, and if you really can learn, you can use scratch images and uh, uh, base scratch image actually uh, doesn't contain anything. So it's basically zero megabytes, but also with an asterisk because all of those images under the hood also have their operating, really small operating system. Uh, so like it's not actually zero. And also when you will uh, upload your binaries, uh, that's actually why we uh, spend some time talking about how to decrease the size of your binary, because in final image, uh, you will have your binary too. Uh, so one thing about uh, scratch images, uh, they're really great because they're really small, uh, but, and also, uh, tend to be more secure. 
but you should keep in mind that uh, we have our security vulnerabilities, yep, and they came with uh, some software uh, that was installed. That basically the argument to, to use crash image because it doesn't have anything. But you also should keep in mind that there are some apps that are actually providing us security, like firewalls, some things to check permissions, or et cetera. So you should keep in mind that it's really, uh, you should have really good reasons to use Scratch image uh, to run your application in production, because uh, it may be really hard to actually make it secure and to run your application. Uh, and you may even not win with image size because you will need to install some additional things. So my recommendation is to uh, use Alpine images or even plain Ubuntu or Debian. Uh, and to, uh, as here discussed, uh, like uh, the image size is not comparing in hundreds of megabytes. So uh, you can go with that. So that will be quite good too. Because also Scratch Images has some really bad disadvantages. So it doesn't have shell, so you will not be able to uh, go inside the container and check some things. So <clears throat> there is no way to do that. Uh, you don't have some basic stuff like CS certificates. You don't have some basic configuration, maybe some environment variables that you expect to have, but they will not be present there. <clears throat> you will not be able to run debug there. There is no support uh, for Sego or anything like that. There is no easy way to, to do the health check. Uh, but, and like many more uh, disadvantages and limitations of that. But all of them are with an asterisk because uh, as I showed you, you can create like really small binaries to have your cell health check. You can provide your CA certificates from a uh, different base image. So all of those issues can actually be resolved, but you should really have a reason to spend time resolving those uh, to get the benefits that you're getting from Spurge images. Um, regarding health check, uh, generally in your apps, you want it to be fast and really basic because uh, health check is the thing that is running uh, constantly on your apps and uh, you are getting it like every 10 seconds, every 30 seconds, whatever you configure it. Um, <clears throat> so it's good to have it lightweight and for example, not to do some uh, database queries or uh, some requests to other services that may take time. Uh, and Actually, depending on your environment, you might even not need health check in Docker uh, image itself. Um, because for example, if you're running uh, your container inside of Kubernetes or AWS CloudFormation or some other stuff. So those things, generally speaking, have their own health checks that are not uh, inside Docker containers uh, at all. So your Docker container health check will do nothing and only waste your uh, CPU usage and maybe lock your system even if it's like really frequent. But for example, if you're running your container in environments like Docker Swarm, uh, it actually fully depends on uh, health check to, for example, make uh, uh, rolling updates. Uh, if you in Docker Swarm don't have health check, uh, your applications will uh, definitely lose requests when doing uh, rolling updates, because the main thing what Docker Swarm uses to check uh, if we can stop the container is uh, is new container is healthy, and if you don't have health check, if the application is started, it means that it's healthy, but it not might be the case in all time, so you should check that. And to CI CD, mm, so you should remember to uh, run your tests and linters, and you can use uh, Docker for your CI actually too. So you don't need to set up any environments or something like that. You can use plain Docker for that. Um, you should build your images in uh, your CI, scan them, and only after that push the registry. So uh, let's talk. 
<clears throat> more about that. Uh, if you're testing and running linters or anything like that in your Docker, it provides like really good benefits actually that uh, often people forget about. Uh, so first one that is maybe obvious is that you don't need to set up an environment. Uh, because you're running in Docker, you can do that one time and uh, it will run on any your CI servers or, for example, if you will change CI, I don't know, for example, from uh, GitLab CI to Jenkins, uh, it doesn't matter because uh, your dependencies that is needed to, to execute your test linters and whatever uh, is right in your Docker file. And another one that is uh, not that common uh, is that you can run tests in Docker, but apart from regular unit tests, you can actually run performance tests really well because Docker provides very really good APIs to limit the resources of your uh, applications. So uh, your performance and load tests actually uh, can be checked uh, like really good because you will know exact numbers uh, of uh, uh, memory usage and CPU usage and maybe for example disk IO if you are doing that. <clears throat> so it will be really good. And also integration tests <clears throat> because you can for example run Docker Compose in your CI to start up a test database or like any other external service that is needed for integration testing and uh, to fully run your application uh, as it is in production, but with, for example, mocked services. So <clears throat> you will get uh, all the benefits of this using Docker. Uh, but also one additional step that you will need to do if you're using Docker is, uh, apart from running linters and tests and like security scanning on your code, you will actually need to run those things on your images uh, because uh, you're using uh, additional software. So for example, if you're running Ubuntu, you get all the software that comes with Ubuntu. So you'll get all vulnerabilities that Ubuntu has. So you need to keep in mind that you will need to scan your images, for example, with Travi, Docker scan plugin or whatever fits your use case. Um, so this is one of important things. Uh, and also for scanning, you should actually check your licenses because uh, uh, it's not really good uh, in legal terms uh, to use something uh, that is licensed uh, as non-open source and free to use in commercial things. Uh, and during that thing, you can also create your containers uh, in CI. You can create test Docker images, Docker containers and images uh, to run uh, in your CI. So you can, for example, uh, make uh, with Docker Compose some image, run it on CI and run your actual integration tests, uh, not using uh, Go tests or something like that, and, but any other tool. And the last thing is the workflow how you would actually achieve uh, having your app in Docker, uh, what are things that you should consider, like uh, uh, should you use Docker Compose, make file, task file, uh, how to check your logs in your application, how to debug it if you're running that in Docker, because most, most of the people don't even know that it's, it's possible. It's a bit harder, but like I don't think it's much. And when you're caching everything, what can go wrong? So let's discuss it. And uh, right now we will have a small demo. So you can scan the QR code if you want to look at the code. So it is uh, public on GitHub. So you can check that uh, right now or later, whatever you want. And let's go to our demo. So I created some small app uh, that actually has, uh, it has configuration, it has logger, and it has a simple uh, HTTP server with two endpoints, one with slash that actually just returns hello and logs random number, and with health endpoints that just returns running true and current time of the server. So pretty simple. Uh, I am using ZAP logger and Echo framework for that, but you can use whatever you want. For configurations, 
I just have simple config struct uh, with some values like the port I want to run my service on, or this like some shutdown time, uh, what is logger that needs to be done and needs to be used. And uh, I am using uh, uh, some cool package that uh, Carlos created. Uh, it's called env. It provides us to uh, easily parse our environment variables so we can create just our config struct and use and the parse so it will parse our environment into our structure and we can specify like all things that we need and really cool package validate uh, that can provide us validation of our structure so for example that port is uh, within zero and uh, 6500 thousand that uh, our shutdown time in out is greater than zero or that like our logger is a development or production logger, but we can check that and like add any other configurations as we want. And really useful things for uh, running your application, not in Docker, but just locally, uh, is uh, using uh, .environment files. And there is a cool uh, package to automatically read that file if it exists. Uh, so you just need to import it for side effects and uh, you will get your config from environment uh, for free. And actually like my environment file looks like this. So it has like demo port, demo shutdown time and demo logger. And as you can see for development, we have a demo logger as dev. Yep. So it will uh, allow us to run our application. And uh, if you run it just like that, go run dot. It doesn't require anything, so uh, we can go to browser and uh, not that one, this one. So we can go to localhost 8080 and we will see our hello world, our logs that we are logging our requests. So we have successful from remote on get slash, and we can go to, for example, health, and we will see our health check running. Um, so <clears throat> And this was like running our app just locally. Uh, it, as you saw, doesn't require any Docker, so you can easily run that. Uh, but we are introducing Docker, and uh, here is an example of multi-stage build that can be used actually in production. Uh, first stage, as I showed you, uh, we are just copying our source code. Uh, and again, we are splitting our dependencies and full source code. Uh, we are running uh, our application with, uh, in development with AIR. This is some cool tool um, developed by these guys, which uh, allows you to automatically uh, relaunch your app uh, when uh, your code is changing. So it has like a small configuration. Uh, so we are in command, we are just building our app. Yep, so we are just plain running go build and putting it binary in a demo folder, uh, dem, bin demo. And uh, when we are actually running our app, we are using uh, DLB. It's our debugger. So we are just executing the binaries that we created previously. And we are running our debugger uh, on port uh, 2345 uh, with headless mode. So we will get our debugger and uh, I will show you how to use it a bit later. And again, this is only dev stage, uh, which is not uh, executed on production. So it actually doesn't matter for us if we put latest versions here, um, because generally in production Docker files, you should always pin a version of your dependencies. But here it doesn't matter for the workflow. After that, we have a stage to test our image uh to run tests uh and it's like really simple just go run tests and it will fail if our test failing uh last two steps are to build our image and again as we are using to, uh, to release uh, a scratch image we don't have our ca certificates so we are updating that uh yep and after that we will clone them here uh, and we are just building that and after that running. Um, so <clears throat> we can just use Docker for that, but it will require us to create our, build our images manually. 
Uh, so it's not very useful for us to run that locally. Uh, and that's why we have Docker Compose files. So uh, in Docker Compose, we can describe services that we want. And here I have two example services. So one of them are actually our uh, demo app, which is built from Docker file here and it's target to dev. Uh, and because we are hot reloading, we actually included uh, in our container all our source code. So uh, Air can check uh, like any Go files that were updated and uh, uh, reload the image. Uh, we actually overwrote uh, our uh, logger to be uh, production for Docker. Uh, and we include our .n file, because why not? And as you might expect, we exported actually two ports, not one. First one is for running our actual application. And second one is for running debugger to be able to connect to it. Uh, and as, as you can see here, we are running it on the same port. So uh, we can just run our Docker Compose up. And uh, we will see <laughs> that we are actually running again. And we can check that our app is working. We have everything, so we have logs. But additionally, uh, I have added one really small service, uh, which is called uh, Dozzle. Uh, it's a small app uh, that uh, provides us with uh, uh, actually logs from our Docker. Uh, it's really lightweight. It's uh, it doesn't have a lot of features, uh, but it allows you to view your logs from your any of your Docker containers uh, with a little UI that even has search, so you can search for something. <coughs> and uh, like I think it's like a better way than just looking into console to to check your logs. But you can use whatever you want. And one small improvement that we can do to our workflow is actually to add something like make file or as in this example, task file. So task files as for those who are not familiar is just an alternative to make file with a bit more verbose uh, syntax, but it I think uh, provides like more useful feature without cryptic syntax uh, and uh, I prefer them uh, better. So uh, here I have just some task to uh, run our Docker Compose, uh, to restart Docker Compose, to uh, rebuild our images, uh, to echo something, uh, to watch our Docker containers, to watch logs here. So we can try that. So we can do task up and it will run just Docker Compose up minus D and it will provide us with links to our logs and to our service. So we, this is really useful when you're running it locally. Uh, we can watch our containers. So we can check that here we have our uh, image with uh, our app and its container name server, and it exposed some ports, and we can see the status here. And we can get logs from our service. So as usual, we can check them from console or from uh, that service. And we can check how our reloading, uh, how reloading actually works. So uh, as you might remember, uh, we can go to 8080 and it returns hello world. And we can change that, for example, for GoPair. Yep, and we change that and a couple of seconds, and we already have our new content. So, and in logs, we can easily see that uh, uh, AR detected that handler.got changed. It built it. Uh, it actually restarted the bugger for us. Uh, it's running, and it says that, yep, our service is running. So we have something. Uh, for debugging purposes, uh, we started DBL. Uh, DLV, sorry. Uh, and you can use it is pretty much uh, any editor. Uh, Visual Studio Code actually works too. Uh, Veeam, whatever. In JetBrains, Colant, you can uh, just set up a simple configuration to run debugger. You just specify the host and the port. 
uh, and it's like go remote. Yep. And you can run it. And for example, here I put breakpoint uh, on N and we are just generating random number and putting the logs here. So if you go to main page, it actually triggered the breakpoint. We can see what is the value of N. Uh, we can step over, we can check like this, this logs will be executed. So basically you have all that your debugger provides. You have all the values. And uh, keep in mind that our app is running in Docker and we are easily uh, debugging that. So we can proceed and for example, our request will complete here and we can stop that. So this is how to debug your apps running in Docker. And again, you don't need to have pot reloading. Uh, it's just like easy uh, to implement in case your app doesn't have like some configuration uh, predefined. Uh, and you can just simply use uh, DLV if you don't want that. Uh, and you can replace in your Docker file running uh, not air, but actually DLV. Uh, and provide it first with the binary. You should build it before, or you can use the bug mode of DLV. So it will uh, build it uh, automatically. So it's whatever is your use case. Um, and also some things that uh, people uh, sometimes tend to forget is that caching is uh, uh, both good and bad. And actually, for example, if we build our image, yep. So you can see that it started our containers almost instantly. Uh, and this is because uh, all the images were cached. And if we run it with build, so it just uses uh, Docker Compose up and dash dash build to force a build it. As we can see, uh, almost all layers were cached. That means that uh, they are not executed again. Uh, but uh, as for example, for our source code, it may be not an issue because uh, we are using hot reloading for that. But for example, uh, for Go modules, yep, so it was cached. And let's see if I, for example, add some comments here. Test, yep. Uh, and we trigger build again. So this time it actually uh, copied it again, but uh, from time to time it happens that uh, Docker doesn't cache, uh, sorry, even cache uh, files even if you change them. So uh, it might be the case that you need to force rebuild it. Oh, I know why it's it build it because I used uh, command with build. If we do that again. Yep. So as you can see, I changed our go mode file and just run go com docker compose up uh, with D and it didn't rebuild our image, even though we changed one of our files. Uh, so you should remember when you're making changes that are uh, not exactly in your source code, but for example, in your dependencies, uh, as in our docker file, we uh, described our source uh, as copying dependencies and source files. So with source files, it's okay because uh, we actually like running this only the first time we scope it. And after that, we have our volume attached here. So we actually have all our uh, files inside Docker container when we are running that in development. So that's okay. But for example, uh, our dependencies were downloaded before uh, we actually executed our uh, build and we never uh, downloaded them again. So this is some caching problems that you should be aware of. And that's precisely the reason why I have uh, like up with build that will just uh, force uh, Docker Compose to rebuild our images. And basically that's it. Maybe you have some questions. Check and both. Yep. So I know it about uh, env uh, config. So this package is also really cool, uh, and it provides you visibility to uh, 
specify uh, also structure and debug it uh, and parse it. Uh, I just, uh, for me personally, it uh, was more convenient to use uh, uh, the package uh, in V uh, from Carlson because it provides you with uh, uh, prefix. You can provide the field of name, uh, the name fields here also. Uh, and as far as I remember, he added a way to uh, have default names for the fields. So basically, it's just an alternative that you can use too. Uh, interesting question. How to import uh, from private repositories? Uh, so you can actually use sync called, uh, sorry, not that browser. Yeah, I, I ask because usually Gomod download is fairly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, net RC, uh, I don't net RC. Uh, oh, five. Yep. So, yeah, this one. Uh, I can give you a link to this in the chat. Uh, so, this is pretty uh, cool thing. What is with my Zoom? Uh, for downloading packages externally, uh, what I recommend uh, is having a NetRC file, uh, which will provide, uh, but uh, which you can provide with uh, environment variable, for example. So you can store in your .nf file uh, the values that you should here, both here, and what this allows you to do. Uh, what GoMod does, it actually uses uh, Git to download your packages. So basically, to download private packages, you need your Git to work with your private repository. And to do that, the easiest thing is to uh, go to your uh, remote repository and generate uh, API token and have your login. And DVL, uh, sorry, NetRC provides you with a way you can provide your login and password uh, in that file. And by default, Git it will read it from there. So you will get uh, access to your uh, remote repositories like that. Yep, that's a good question. Cool, thank you. Um, about Sigo, uh, as I said, uh, there is no need to run your uh, image using uh, uh, Scratch image. So you can easily do that with Alpine, or if you don't want to mess up with any dependencies, because by default, Alpine doesn't provide everything that is needed with Sigo. Uh, you can use uh, uh, Ubuntu or Debian-based images. As you can see, they are pretty small too. So if you don't really want to spend time uh, configuring that and checking, like, will it work or not, uh, it's much simpler to to use any other base image to your for your release. Uh, I just, as an example, provided a way how to run that without Sego because uh, the first thing in source code that I do is disable Sego so that we are getting static, uh, static linked images and we can run them inside a uh, scratch image. But you can get rid of this and just use uh, not scratch, but for example, Ubuntu. Yep. And you will get your Sego support out of the box. Any other maybe questions? And uh, I'm curious about ng point and CMD because mm -hmm. uh, they usually uh, use during uh, Docker run command. So when you just launch a new container, you, usually you want to uh, redeclare them. So CMD mm -hmm. is very easily uh, redefined by adding new parameters. But for ng point, mm -hmm. you should provide like additional uh, flags. Yep, so I described that actually, and like we discussed that we have an entry point and it's actually the, the beginning of the comment and CMD is what is appended to it at the end. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's easy to add uh, some command line flags in CMD and your actual app in entry point. Care run some, I don't know, uh, let's Alpine, just, just run Alpine. Yep, so uh, it couldn't find and it downloads. Uh, 
I wanted to IT interactively. Yep. Oh, because I didn't provide anything. So for example, if you have Alpine, it doesn't have CMD. So we can provide, for example, echo oak. And it will output oak. And actually it was run inside the Alpine image. So the thing is uh, that anything that you put after the image name actually treats as CMD. So for example, I have my image called uh, mini health. Yep. Uh, and if you run it like that, uh, sorry, not mini health, but mini health, yep. Uh, so it's returned to 100 okay. But what, what is, why is it that? Because in my uh, image, I unpurposely left uh, uh, call just to example.org as a CMD. So here's a good example how you can use it. So here entry point is mini health, yeah, but CMD is actual URL we want to call. And for example, if you want to call some site uh, that does not exist, does, yep. So this site most definitely doesn't exist. It actually called it and uh, we received that no such host exists. And we can provide any other site and it will return okay. And that's precisely because uh, it treats CMD as an argument to entry point. And uh, you can create some cool uh, command line uh, utilities that actually runs in Docker, but you can use them providing arguments from your shell using Docker run and providing them like here. To use your debug uh, mod for Docker file. Uh, will it work in the same way with remote Docker file? For example, when you deploy it somewhere in your environment, like dev environment, test environment, mm -hmm. and you want to uh, proceed with debug. So basically, the only requirement here when you're using uh, DLB uh, as debugger is uh, this listen uh, URL and port. So you actually need it to be accessible from whatever environment you're running. And uh, you're just connecting it using TCP connection uh, to this port. So basically, if your dev environment uh, has this port open and you have the URL to it, uh, you can connect uh, as here. You just will change uh, in your configuration, like lo your local host, to uh, the URL of your dev environment, which has this port open. And you can connect and run debugger like that. And as I said, this uh, debugger, like it's common in all uh, IDEs. So in VS code, it should be present in Sublime text and in JetBrains Galant, as I showed you, it is here. 